Hello everyone, this is Christina Jang from ITDP and welcome to our webinar today. Before we begin, there are a few things to note. This webinar will be recorded and both the recording and PowerPoint will be available online to you within a week. To interact with me and our host today, please submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom or the top of your Zoom screen. Please refrain from using the chat box. We also encourage you to enter questions throughout today's presentation because it will not interrupt our speaker. Again, thank you to everyone for joining our webinar today titled Creating Better Cities Through Better Streets. Streets are not only the conduits for mobility and utilities, but they also form a huge chunk of our public space inventory. Designing streets as complete streets that cater to a myriad of different user groups and activities ensures a livable city that is sustainable. In today's webinar, ITDP India will look at why we need complete streets, as well as their principles and benefits. Ashwadi Dilip will introduce the Complete Streets Toolkit and highlight all the pieces of the puzzle that need to come together to create better streets that result in better cities. Today, our presenter is Ashwadi Dilip, the Senior Program Manager leading the Complete Streets Strategy Policy and Projects for ITDP India. She works with national, state, and city governments, providing them with technical assistance on sustainable and equitable urban mobility. Her most exciting work includes transforming congested roads into vibrant streets for space for all users, helping cities implement bold parking reforms, and building support for high quality sustainable mass transit. She has also organized car free Sundays, intersection design testing, and public space exhibitions. She is really interested and passionate about ordinary yet uncommon sites such as children playing carelessly in the streets, elderly chit-chatting joyfully, and women traveling confidently in our public spaces in cities, which is really what makes her smile. So thank you to Ashwadi for hosting our webinar today. And whenever you are ready, you can share your screen. Thank you, Christina, for the wonderful introduction. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can see it on my end. It's just not in, um, oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. put it in presenter mode. Yes, looks great, thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. I hope all of you all can hear me. So welcome everybody to today's webinar on creating better cities through better streets. I'm Ashwati Dilip, your host, uh, for the next one hour. So today, we, I'm going to first take you all through a um, decade-long journey that ITDP India has been going through in many Indian cities to create better streets. I'd like to share with you the challenges that we faced, the solutions that we created, which I think each one of you all can put to practice in whichever city that you are from. So let me take you back to 2009, when we were really working with city officials trying to transform their minds to create better streets. The voices that we heard from most offices was that our cities are filled with vehicles. The way private vehicle population is increasing at an alarming pace. In fact, in one of the cities, Chennai, in South India that we were working with, there was an official who was telling us that there are 30 lakh private vehicles in the city and we need more space for them. But as we walked um, and spoke to the users on the ground, what we heard was quite different. So one of the uh, ladies who worked as a house help in different um, houses in the neighborhood, she told us in the local language that meaning that she walks by holding her life or heart in her hand. While the officials were extremely confident that there were no cyclists in our cities, we heard stories of cyclists who were cycling for more than 40 years from the time that they received a cycle while they were in their school. 
we heard stories of people who had fallen, um, who had faced accidents on their cycle and who had to really uh, overcome that fear and get back to cycling. In fact, facts showed that there were as many cyclists in the city as the number of cars, just that the cars utilize the space very inefficiently and were there for all of us to see. These were not stories of one or two people, but it was the story of many, many people. In fact, two thirds of all the trips in Indian cities are even today carried out by walk, cycle or public transport. Yet, when it comes to the design of our streets, we tend to most often prioritize uh, the private vehicle user. Our vulnerable users are most often pushed towards the fringes of the road with very little design. And as a result of which, there has been an extremely alarming number of deaths um, occurring on a daily basis in Indian cities. In fact, 56 pedestrians uh, died uh, in 2018. Also, it's very important to note that walking and public transport are extremely integral when it comes to uh, the needs of women. Uh, research showed that eight out of 10 trips by women are on foot or public transport. Hence, it was extremely important for us to design our streets as complete streets for all users and users. And we, over the last decade, have actually followed a three-pronged approach. Number one, we worked uh, towards inspiring champions and building partnerships. In this picture, what you see is a walk that we had organized for decision makers from uh, many of the important departments that actually work together for transforming the streets. The man whom you see in uh, the white striped shirt is in fact the municipal commissioner um, of the city of Chennai. So while these decision makers were extremely well-meaning people, since their experiences were within um, uh, a car in which that they travel, the kind of choices that they made were quite different. While we took them for a walk uh, through the traffic that was extremely scary, uh, in conditions that were very uncomfortable, it really transformed many of these leaders into champions who really pioneered the non-transport movement in many of the cities. Along with champions, it was also important for us to collaborate with local designers to come out with design solutions for these streets. As you can see in the left, it's the same street uh, with a quite narrow footpath and an electricity box kept perpendicular to the movement, uh, to the line of uh, movement. This made users or pedestrians walk on the street rather than on the footpath. A small change in design by increasing the width of the footpath to a usable uh, width, along with the um, electricity box moved parallelly, really changed the environment and made the footpath a lot more usable uh, for the pedestrians. As pilots were, as, as champions were created and the champions were creating these pilots, uh, these demonstration pilots that were inspiring change, it was very important for us to embed these challenges, uh, embed these changes uh, through adoption of policies and standards. These standards, as you can see here, is a standard which was uh, adopted by the city of Pune, ensured that streets across the city had the same set of guidelines. Uh, in Chennai, uh, another city which was pioneering uh, in this particular transformation. It, uh, it was one of the first cities to adopt a non-motorized transport policy. And having adopted this policy every year, it strives to achieve its goals by ensuring that streets were redesigned on a regular uh, basis. And today, after five years, while the city has created 100 kilometers of streets, it now looks forward to create a citywide network plan and it is looking to transform the entire city. Along with inspiring and embedding, it was extremely important to expand the transformation by ensuring that there was the right kind of institutional reforms in place, as well as uh, having extensive capacity building programs for engineers working in these different cities either through formal training programs in association with um, academic institutions or also through site visits to other cities that had really uh, pioneered 
the change. So we followed a three-prong approach of inspire, embed, and expand. Today, I will be focusing our uh, discussion on the process of embedding um, change or embedding transformation through policy, design guidelines, and standards. So an important catalyst that actually really changed the scenario was the National Smart City Mission, which was launched uh, in 2015. Now, in, through this particular program, 100 cities receive funds to transform uh, their streets. And one of the important focus areas of uh, this particular mission was also to create streets for pedestrians, um, cyclists, public transport users, etc. Now, while we did the review of uh, multiple projects by different cities after a year, we realized that while now the cities had funds, they still lack some very um, important basics, such as what actually constitutes a complete street. Sometimes uh, there were certain cities that actually only looked at um, looked at introducing a smart light and then imagined it um, to be a complete street. So we needed to put together a set of guidelines or standards that would help cities to create complete streets. So in collaboration with the National Smart Cities Mission, we created a toolkit on creating complete streets. Today, I'm going to take you through each of these um, guidelines very briefly and let you know what each of these comprise of. Firstly, let's take a look at the policy framework document. This document is targeted at decision makers. Now, um, any, uh, any stakeholder interested in convincing the decision, uh, decision makers can use this particular document. This document starts with what exactly is a function of a street. A street is not just a conduit for vehicles to move from one location to the other. It, it provides access to jobs, education, and amenities. It provides economic opportunities. It provides social and recreational opportunities as well as in the case of multiple city, uh, multiple streets, such as the promenade that you see here from uh, Pondicherry to the Times Square in New York or the Rambla in Barcelona, it provides identity to a city. A street, in fact, has many uses. While it is uh, an area that is used uh, for walking, cycling, informal and formal public transportation, as well as personal motor vehicles, it's also a space under which various utilities are housed. It provides space for parked vehicles, but it also acts as a wonderful park, uh, public space for people to gather, spaces where they have vending, as well as shopping. In fact, it hosts a variety of people, ranging from pedestrians to cyclists, women as much as men, children and elderly who are both dependent and independent, as well as the differently abled. As I mentioned, as a result of all of these reasons, it's very important for us to design streets for all users and users. But uh, one might wonder, what are the principles under which such streets should be designed? Firstly, it's very important to ensure that these streets have efficient mobility, such that we allocate space equitably to all users and such uh, that the users have option of multiple modes of travel. A street should be designed with high quality facilities for both public as well as non-motorized transport. It needs to be safe with um, uh, traffic calming measures and safe crossing, as well as it needs to focus on personal safety by providing good lighting, active edges, as well as wending on the streets. Next, the streets need to be accessible for all and by all. Simple measures such as continuous and even surface footpaths, tabletop crossing and ramps, and tactile pavers where level differences occur could all help in improving accessibility to a great extent. Streets are also a great opportunity for us to increase the livability of our cities by providing elements such as uh, seating under trees 
providing play elements, street vending, and providing active edges, we can really in improve the livability of our streets. While we get inspired by streets across the world, as we bring design to a particular street in our city or neighborhood, it's very, very important for us to contextualize the, uh, the design. It's important to take into consideration the land uses that surround this particular street, the patterns of pedestrian cyclist movement, and also to factor local activities. So you might have two streets of the same width, but depending on the surrounding land uses, the design of these streets might be extremely different from one another. Last but not the least, it's a great opportunity for us to really improve our environmental sustainability. Designing our streets in the right manner will actually help us promote sustainable modes of transport. It would help us improve our local climatic conditions, reduce pollution and heat, and as well as capture and channel rainwater through design. Now that we've designed, we've looked at how, what are the principles that, uh, you know, complete streets should be designed, one uh, would always question, but what are the kind of benefits that we would get in case we actually followed this route? So here, uh, the document also uh, takes you through various um, case studies and lists out the benefits that these projects have helped um, in catalyzing. I've uh, taken out a few uh, to share with you. So one is that is an example of a street in Bangalore, which really helped improve the sustainable mode share. So pedestrian volumes had gone up by about 250% um, in uh, this particular street. In the street in Strokket, vibrancy had improved a great deal with about 145 people walking per minute in this particular street after the street was pedestrianized. In, the New, York, uh, in New York City, uh, the Plaza program helped reduce pedestrian accidents by 35%. And in uh, Argentina, in Buenos Aires, um, the revamped street design helped reduce bus travel time by 63%, uh, uh, ensuring equitable mobility for all. Now that we've, you know, we've been able to um, champ create champions for complete streets, then we look at what are the next steps that need to be designed. Uh, that needs to be carried out. So you have a champion who's ready to take on uh, the process of transforming streets as complete streets. What would be the next steps that the city should take? So most often cities do get interested in uh, doing pilot designs. While um, a few pilot streets are being carried out, it's extremely important for us to encourage the city to adopt a complete street policy. Why, you may ask. Uh, it's very important to ensure the long-term sustainability such that the city creates goals over a 10 or a 15 year period, and then looks to achieve that over uh, this particular period. And their interest does not die down uh, by only creating a handful of pilots. So the Complete Streets Policy Workbook really uh, lays out the process of how can you, how should you envision or set goals for a city? How can we actually um, ensure that all stakeholders are engaged in the process? It provides a template that the cities can use for drafting the policy. Uh, the template uh, could be used um, for discussion with the different stakeholders, refined, and further, it also provides a process that is followed in Indian cities for adoption of policies, including uh, having the policy put out for public consultation. It also um, highlights the important institutions that you need in place to ensure that the goals that have been uh, set out by the uh, policy are met uh, over the years. So the most important aspect is uh, to understand that a street design actually includes a whole variety of departments. The streets, in fact, may be owned by different road owning agencies, then multiple utilities such as the electricity, um, telephone cables, water supply, sewage system, solid waste management, trees, etc., are maintained by different departments or different organizations within the city. Uh, traffic police uh, ma uh, manages traffic on these streets. 
Uh, and hence, it's very important for us right at the beginning to invite all of these different stakeholders, including some civil society organizations, um, um, inspiring or encouraging academia in the city to come together and draft the vision and goals uh, for the city and build consensus around the same. Uh, including all of these stakeholders right in the beginning plays a very critical role in ensuring the successful implementation of the project going forward. We could use the, the, the document actually lists a few questions you could use as a starting point. What is the kind of city that you would want to live in? How will mobility, particularly for pedestrians and cyclists in the future be very different from how it is today? These could be some of the starting questions that you could actually start with um, when you have a discussion with the stakeholders to create a shared vision. Having created the policy and adopted the policy, um, simultaneously, it's very, very important for us to look at the institutional framework that is essential for the successful implementation of complete streets. We look at having two committees uh, or departments. One is the Apex Committee, which is particularly interested in uh, improving coordination between the different agencies. During the course of the project, you will understand that different agencies, it's not just one department's role while designing the street, as I showed you in the previous picture. If it requires an electricity box to be moved from perpendicular to parallel, it means that the electrical department has to act at the right time. So having these coordination meetings regularly will ensure that various agencies are, um, are kept to speed and it, we, we can ensure that there is a consistent engagement between all of these different stakeholders. While the Apex Committee's role is particularly focused on coordination, it's also important for the city to have a complete street cell. Now, this cell comprises of uh, designers uh, as well as external experts, and their main role is to support in planning, designing the streets, as well as overseeing and monitoring the work that is produced by design consultants and contractors, as well as ensuring the general maintenance of the street going forward. Now, having created a policy and having the right institutions in place, it is very important for cities to now create a, um, um, a master plan, a complete streets master plan for the city. So in the past, as we were working with cities, as you can see in this particular picture, this is a picture where we've mapped out the streets created by the city of Chennai. Now, uh, these um, are streets which were built, uh, were implemented across the years, but they were picked up as uh, discontinuous segments. So while the street itself was well designed, after a few hundred meters, there were other streets which were not designed. And hence, from the end user's perspective, initially, it was, a, uh, uh, it didn't, uh, uh, it, it was not totally comprehensive. Over the years, the city has tried to stitch together uh, streets and create uh, networks, but it would be very useful for us to right from the beginning, have a master plan in place and work, um, you know, try to create packages which form continuous networks and implement them. So this document sets out the process of how to create a complete street master plan. So um, it initially starts by listing out the data points that you need to gather in order to create a plan. It also gives you um, um, data sources for collecting this particular data. Secondly, it looks at how can you use this data and create a complete street master plan. And with the master plan in place, um, finally, it looks at what are the indicate what are the ways in which you would face the design out. How would you um, come up with costing, budget the same, as well as der uh, derive financing for the same. So here, um, the Complete Streets Master Plan has um, mostly three networks. First is the pedestrian network that looks at streets which have segregated footpaths, identifies streets which are pedestrian only, uh, streets which may have, which may be of pedestrian priority, as well as uh, streets which are slow zones with uh, 15 to 30 kilometer per, um, per hour zones around schools. 
The Greenways Network looks at um, identifying and linking canals, lakes, and other natural features. And the cycle track, uh, the cycle network looks at identifying streets which are uh, used um, often by cyclists and identifying the streets which will need segregated cycle track and also streets which will be of cycle priority. Once the master plan is put in place, um, uh, the streets are mapped based on ROW and uh, or the right of um, width and design recommendations would be given uh, for each of these different types. And based on that, uh, we would be looking at packaging the projects um, we will be looking at packaging projects, coming out with the project cost and timeline um, based on the total length of the street and the type of design that is planned for each of these streets. Now that you have a, 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 a full complete streets plan in place, we would prioritize the first package. And as we start designing these streets, it's very important for us to know about the different elements and how these different elements uh, need to be, uh, how do you play with each of these different elements for local context? So let's take a look at this particular picture. Now, this is a street which has mm, space allocated towards pedestrians. Unfortunately, pedestrians tend to use the road. And why do you think so? The footpath is extremely discontinuous and it requires a person to climb up and down, up and down, almost as though we are preparing people, our, our citizens for a hurdles race in the Olympics. So these are features that these are, even though space has been allocated for pedestrians, if not properly designed, they can actually uh, remain unused. And hence, it's very important for us to get the design elements right. Here is another picture. We have a wonderfully wide uh, pedestrian crossing, but which goes bang straight into the median. So this is another example of how you might have the right element, but if it's not properly designed, it cannot be used by anyone. So the design process, uh, the, the design workbook actually takes you through the different uh, pieces of this particular puzzle. How do you hire a consultant? Uh, the um, document gives you a template that can be used for hiring a high quality, uh, a well experienced consultant. And once the consultant is brought on board, how to, what are the things that you need to study at site? What is the analysis that you need to carry out? And how do you create a conceptual design by using the design templates that are provided in the document? And how do you detail the design out by uh, looking at the various street design elements uh, guidelines that are provided in the document? Finally, how do you create estimates and BOQs? And during the entire process, how do you engage with the review committee and ensure that the design is participatory in nature? So here are some of the elements that have been detailed out in, in the document. Each of the elements such as uh, the footpath, cycle track, um, two elements such as seating or bollards, all of these are detailed out in uh, the document. I'll just quickly take you through one of the elements, for example, the footpath. I'm not going to take you through in all details, but just give you a, 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 a small um, insight. So with respect to the footpath, a footpath needs to be designed as three different zones, the frontage or the dead zone, which is the zone where a person might stop and look at, uh, uh, look into a shop that is nearby, or in case of a dead wall, this might be an area that people don't often um, go close towards. The central pedestrian zone is a um, um, continuous area where pedestrians would be walking. And the final, uh, zone towards uh, the carriageway is the multi-utility zone where um, uh, we could provide trees, uh, space to sit, etc., depending on the width of the street and the land use uh, surrounding the area. So, for example, this is an example of a street which actually has these three areas, the frontage zone, the pedestrian zone, and the multi-utility zone. 
having provided details of every single element, the book also goes into details of the different design templates that you can use. So if you're designing a street and the street is 12 meters um, ROW, depending on the land uses around, it provides um, a series of templates that you could use um, in order to design that particular street. It also goes into details of intersection templates. How do you design the street if there are transit systems such as a metro or a bus rapid system? What are the different street materials that you could use? What are the pros and cons of each of these materials? And how can you ensure that you have a participatory street design through this entire process? All of this is covered in the design workbook. Now, while the design is put in place, as we were working with some of the engineers, we noticed that in one of the um, sites that we were working, the engineer had forgotten to lay the curbstone. And hence, we realized that it's very, very important also to look at the implementation. What is the step-by-step -step process that needs to be followed while you are implementing a street? Now, this workbook um, starts when the designer has created good for tender drawings and the tendering process of the contractor has begun. So the document does give um, um, an RFP for hiring a contractor. It looks at what are the formalities that needs to be completed before uh, the construction process. So how do you hire a contractor? What should be the roles and responsibilities of the different agencies who are, in, uh, who are, um, uh, who are a part of this particular process? What is the implementation strategy that needs to be thought out? How do you select a pilot stretch such that it is most effective in inspiring citizens to um, sort of support this particular program? All of this is covered in the pre-construction process. Secondly, through the construction process, it takes you through how do you, what are the steps to keep in mind in the pre-excavation process? What do you do during the construction of the street edge and how do you construct the carriageway? And finally, how can we ensure that the street is kept, uh, is well maintained even after the construction of the process? So it goes into um, the construction process uh, so, for example, it looks at, you know, when you look at underneath uh, the street, what are the different um, um, uh, ducts or um, trenches that need to be provided? We support ducts versus uh, trenches because trenches are a lot more expensive. And finally, it also looks at what is it that needs to be done to ensure that our streets are in good quality over a longer duration of time. So it looks at the post-construction process as well. Now that we have looked at various, uh, we've looked at um, having a policy adopted, creating a plan, designing the pilot, ensuring the pilot is well implemented, it's also very important for us to evaluate our projects and program. So uh, the evaluation of uh, this particular project looks at two types of indicators. We look at um, outcome indicators as well as output indicators. So this document goes into detail of how each and every indicator can be collected. Uh, how often should we actually collect um, this particular metric and review the same. Now, these, the main difference between outcome indicators and output indicators are that outcome indicators are broader um, sustainable uh, transport indicators, which the city should aim to achieve. So that is the outcome indicator, while the output indicators are actually specific measurable indicators for walking and cy cycling infrastructure and services, which the city needs to look at achieving. So I'm just going to take you through a couple of examples. So as you had seen here, one of the most important, out the first outcome indicator was about ensuring efficient mobility. So the document looks at the indicator which is the source of data for that indicator? How uh, frequently should you collect this indicator? We also give you a level of difficulty and set a benchmark such that we can, uh, cities across the country and the world can see how they're doing with respect to these indicators. Secondly, uh, the other indicators that are being studied are also the output indicators. So looking at, uh, this, this comes to the project level and it, looks at within this particular project, um, it looks at um, in, uh, indicators, again, in the similar fashion of providing, um, giving um, input on how can you collect this data? How, what is the frequency? 
what is the level of difficulty and what is the benchmark that we should aim to achieve. And finally, while you've been through all of this, you know, most of uh, 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 them, there could be various uh, decision makers or engineers or um, partners whom you see who say that all of this sounds so wonderful, but this is definitely a no-no um, in India. But that's far from, tr uh, from the truth. Many cities across the country are creating ex exemplary examples that uh, we can really look for, uh, uh, we, that we can really learn from. And the Company Street's Best Practices is an always evolving uh, book uh, where we are actually looking at um, collecting all of these best practice ideas. So I'm just going to take you through uh, a few pictures um, to inspire you at the very end of this particular presentation. So this is an example of the of DP Road in Pune. As you can see, the trees are bang in the center of the footpath. Um, uh, the, the street section itself is not very inspiring, but after change, this is how the street looks today. During this particular process, there was extensive engagement with uh, the shopkeepers in this area. The shop owners gave their front set back to the street and ensured uh, that uh, you know, there is a much, much more wider space available for pedestrians uh, to walk. Uh, there were tests, pilots, that uh, there was uh, testing that is done on the street to finalize the design, etc. Um, so this is another picture of DP Road with a lot of space for people to sit. There's, as you can see behind, I'm not sure if you can see, there is the, the green um, uh, circle that you see uh, a little in the background is an outdoor gym. There's a lot of uh, sculpture on the street. This, for example, is an example of JM Road in Pune. Here again, uh, uh, a great point to study is the pilot stretch. The pilot stretch that they had first taken for implementation was outdoor outside a park, a space that could be, uh, that had no pushback from any local stakeholders, which they um, really redesigned extremely well, that then brought in a lot of uh, inspiration and support from the citizens who wanted this to be uh, uh, expanded to other areas as well. Uh, this again is an example of DP Road after uh, the completion of street design. Um, this is the street uh, um, again with a play area in front. Uh, here is an example of Harrington Road in Chennai, an arterial street right outside um, a, a school, uh, which was extremely unsafe, which now has completely transformed even uh, the street design project actually really transform the experiences on this particular street. Now you can see children playing there, laughing, uh, chit-chatting, etc. cetera. Uh, this is another, um, uh, this is the opposite side of the same street. The street actually has five schools. So we tend to see a lot of children uh, really using the space in ways that they could not imagine uh, previously. This is the police commissioner road, as you've already seen. This is once it's been transformed. While the arterial streets were transformed, even local streets were transformed. So this is a local street, um, uh, Raman Street, again with the school in front. And now you can see that the children are walking on safe footpaths. Um, this is a shared street redesigned in Bangalore, um, Church Street. Here is an example of a pedestrian priority street um, in Tinagar, again in Chennai. You can see how the children are really owning up the space and transforming these spaces. This street is to be launched um, um, later this month. Here is a pedestrian street from the small city of uh, Calicut, Koikod in Kerala. So even you know smaller cities are really moving ahead and transforming their streets. This was a street which was full of vehicles uh, packed from one end to the other. And now teeming with people once it's been transformed as an entirely pedestrian um, street. So with this, I come to an end of uh, my presentation. I hope you found this presentation useful. I'm again, Ashwati Dilip. You can always reach out to me at ashwati.dilip at itdp.org. The entire Complete Street Toolkit is available on our website, www.itdp.in. Uh, please feel, uh, feel free to reach out to us in case of any questions or queries. And this work that I've been showcasing right now is actually the work of a large team at ITDP India and uh, I'd like to thank all of them and thank you for listening to me uh, patiently today. Thank you so much. 
Great, thank you so much, Ashwadi. And um, it's great that you have this screen up to show where the materials are available. I also would like our participants to know that we will directly link all of the workbooks and guidebooks in my follow-up email to everyone. So make sure to look out for that as well. So we can go ahead and dive into the questions submitted already. And if participants have more questions, I encourage you to submit them now as well. I'll start off with the first question here for you, Ashwadi. it's from Graham. Are you hearing about repurposed streets, car-free zones, and large bike corrals to encourage more cyclists and easy parking? What kind of design process can you lend to these practices? Christina, can you please repeat that? Is the question listed here? Yes, of course. If you go to the top or the bottom of your screen, there's a button uh, Q&A. Sure. I think, right, I think it's also because um, you were in your PowerPoint mode, so that probably didn't show up. Okay. Can I do something to... How about, um, how about I will share my screen so that yeah. so that it could be minimized for, for you? Sure. Sounds okay. Good. Does that help? Are you able to see the questions now? Yes, I am. I am. I am. Yeah. So I'll just repeat the first question. Repurpose streets, car-free zones, and large and large bike corrals to encourage more cyclists and easy parking. What kind of design process can you lend to these practices? Hi, Graham. Um, thank you for your question. So, with respect to uh, streets and car-free zones, right now, even uh, in India, in Chennai, we're looking at um, creating uh, car-free zones. Um, we do find, um, I mean, there, there, because there are a lot of stakeholders who are involved um, in these processes, for example, traffic police being one of uh, the key members who needs to be sort of, uh, who needs to come on board um, for converting a street into a car-free zone. There's a lot of advocacy that is actually um, involved um, in uh, sort of pushing them into or encouraging them to transform the space into a car-free uh, space. Uh, and that's the first point. Now, when it comes to what kind of, you know, how can you actually design um, uh, this space? The space, uh, so depending, so what we've generally done is that uh, we have done volume counts in some of the cities where we're actually having, um, where we're looking at having uh, spaces uh, created for cyclists. Now, if the right of way is wide enough, then uh, we encourage cities to provide cycle tracks. While if the, if, the, if the street is not wide enough for a segregated cycle track, then we encourage uh, the street to have um, um, to have traffic calming measures. All of these are listed in our street design guidelines. Uh, there are specific sections for uh, cycling, uh, cycle parking, um, uh, cycle, um, cycle tracks uh, design itself. And when it comes to parking on the streets, um, every street design, we ensure that there's specifically spaces allocated towards free parking for cycles. While uh, parking for vehicles are charged, it's very important for us to provide free parking spaces Spaces for cycles. Uh, this may not be or should not be on the footpath because it might then um, uh, hamper the uh, continuous movement of pedestrians, but it would be best if it is allocated within the parking slots that have been provided within the uh, street design. I hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you so much, Ashwadi. I'm going to bundle these uh, next two questions here. Yeah. What are the current challenges that you face and your team faces in cities that you work? And also on the other end, how has the work inspired other cities or could be a catalyst for um, complete streets work in other cities throughout India? Yeah, um, so with respect to um, with respect to inspiring other cities, I think one of the things like I mentioned within my presentation is that um, we really look forward, what we, what we tend to do is um, and um, sort of have 
site visits organized for engineers from different cities to other cities because no matter how much you know you you have presentations for um the 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 team that's working on the project nothing really transformed them as actually seeing the change and we really noticed this with respect to study tours and it's not important not necessary for us to plan study tours across the world india today have enough number of really good quality best practices so if we can actually take um uh, organized study tours for um, the engineering core to the different cities they really get transformed and then once they come back they're really inspired and pushed um uh, to actually sort of uh, mirror that work in their own city in fact for one of the latest projects that we were working the engineering team after doing a study tour encourage the contractors who were working on the project to go for a site visit under their own uh, expenses so we organized a study tour for also the contractors to ensure that the contractors when they are working will uh, ensure that the quality as is is the same as the way the engineers have been um, sort of imagining it in in their minds when you talk about the current challenges that we face i think the challenges are uh, different depending on the kind of city that we are working in so some of the larger cities that we uh, work in so for example in cities uh, with population about 4 million uh, most of the cities they tend to have a very strong engineering core which might be where there might be a a, a a department that focuses only on designing roads or redesigning roads whereas in the in in the smaller cities we've noticed that uh, engineers do a lot of functions from designing of street to maintaining to um, you know uh, uh, having responsibilities of um, water scarcity or water supply or uh, solid waste management etc and as a result in the smaller cities um, th there's a, a a big capacity issue as well as a capability issue hence it's very very important for us to look at having some street design cells either at the state level or at the city who can actually review the design etc and ensure that the design can be executed uh, well because the capacity is quite um, i mean they the engineers unfortunately just have too much on their plate now in the larger cities why it may be um, uh, easy the challenges that we are actually facing is that the traffic police sometimes um, are a little more uh, difficult to convince uh, when it comes um, uh, to transforming streets so um, that's an area where you know where there is a little more needed to actually convince them secondly when it comes to um, working with engineers um, and working on redesigning streets sometimes uh, the engineers for years have um, you know um, excavated the footpath and just relaid it right there so initially even the need for a designer was questioned why do you need a designer today after seeing enough number of high quality projects uh, the uh, the government seems to be quite convinced that they do need uh, to hire high quality designers and also pay the right prices um, in order um, uh, to sort of um, use their services so these are some of the main challenges and uh, this is how we've also looked at inspiring uh, cities great thank you so much ashwadi i'm going to jump down to another question here um, by oscar have there been any local government campaigns to educate drivers and reduce resistance on implementation of these projects so can you talk us through maybe some of the communications campaigns that you were involved in or that you've heard of cities doing around these projects hello oscar this is a very interesting question so um you could actually design and create really beautiful infrastructure but if um there is no enforcement and if um local drivers are going to park on these footpaths then these footpaths are in fact going to become useless and um, hence enforcement is very 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 critical that's one so um what we have been uh, doing i mean so we've been using different methods to actually um work 
in ensuring that our streets are safe for our users and are not encroached by uh, parked vehicles. So one was that um, we have been planning car-free Sundays, uh, one um, to sort of show how the space can be when there are no cars and when there are no parked cars, because this would then create build support with various citizens. And then there would be a push by the citizens itself to prevent cars from being parked on the street. Also in certain neighborhoods, um, uh, there have been um, security guards who have been placed, uh, whose role has been to ensure that there are no uh, uh, vehicles parked on, uh, on the footpath. Um, a a well-managed parking system is also being uh, put in place in many of these cities because Parking really needs to be managed and enforced. So uh, cities are um, hiring service providers and uh, looking to manage parking. And they're also looking at parking as a great revenue source for maintaining these streets. So these are some of the different ways in which uh, we've tried to ensure that the space that we create is not encroached by parked vehicles. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ashwadi. Um, there is another question here on the bottom from sure. uh, Sungun. Um, was there any legal conflicts from the existing road design standards in India and in the cities that you work in to design a new complete street? So, um, hi, Sukun. This is a uh, good question as well. So, um, in, in India, we have uh, the Indian Roads um, Congress, IRC guidelines, which um, you know, they, they tend to provide guidelines for um, designing streets in the country. So, um, most of our guidelines do um, um, they are in alignment with the IRC as well. The IRC itself is being um, sort of, there are uh, many of man, many uh, standards within the IRC which are being revised at the moment and we are um, a member of uh, that committee as well. One of the main approaches while we were creating the guidelines was to make it extremely simple. Our aim was to ensure that, um, uh, that it, it be a lot more graphical such that people can easily understand uh, the guidelines. Sometimes we have a lot of guidelines, but the way they've been written out, it tends to become a, a, a hassle for people to even understand what the guideline is. So the, the toolkit was mostly, um, our aim was to ensure that it's very simple, graphical, such that anyone can actually understand and use this. Um, uh, that's been our focus most often. Also, Sugun, um, so um, while there are guidelines, in certain cases, we may not agree with the guideline in the country. So um, um, one of the examples is with respect to the carriage way width. Uh, the uh, IRC guidelines say that the carriage way width should be about 3.5 meters. But, uh, you know, our research with studies across the world have actually shown that uh, narrower carriage way widths will ensure that the speeds um, of travel is actually reduced and hence can actually be a lot more safer. So in such a case, we have um, given, uh, we have gone in for a, a revised guideline, which actually uh, uh, will ensure that the space is a lot more safer. So where we've not reinvented the guidelines uh, just for the sake of them. So wherever it's been in alignment, we've tried, uh, we've ensured that the guidelines are the same uh, along with the national guidelines. We've just simplified the language, made it more picture, uh, picture uh, I mean, used more infographics such that it's more easier for people to understand. Uh, yet, if there are certain guidelines which we think are not as progressive as they should be, we've really, we've also pushed it and and um, gone ahead as well. And these are also based on designs that have been implemented by various cities in the country, which are also working successfully. So any of these, we could actually show them real life examples of streets which are working well, and hence that's really worked in our favor. Great, thank you, Ashwadi. And I think um, I will take one more question. So I will read out loud the last one we have here. And perhaps this is included in your in your workbooks as well. But 
Generally, how long does it take to identify and or select, design and implement complete street concepts in Indian cities? Um, I know here it says any street, but uh, perhaps you can speak more to a, a project that you have worked on or, or I'd heard of and just give us a bit more insight into the timeline and the process. Hi, Abhinav. Uh, this is a, a very interesting question. So Abhinav, actually, uh, the design, uh, I mean, you know, there is, there, there can always be, a, um, you know, best case scenario, but there can be, you know, street designs can even take years uh, for implementation. So I think, you know, in the past, many of the uh, cities were just sort of uh, beginning to work in this particular uh, area. And hence, some of the some, some of our street design, like um, um, I know a street uh, where we've uh, looked at a converting it into a pedestrian plaza. It's going to be launched later this particular year, but it in fact took about five years uh, because of the different stakeholders, the development bank that was involved, etc. But um, ideally, um, you know, uh, um, in an ideal case scenario, streets can be designed uh, by experienced designers anywhere between four to six months. And uh, these designers may take a package of 10 to 15 kilometers. So if you have um, packages of 10 to 15 kilometers um, of streets in a city, they could be tendered out to designers who can actually complete the design anywhere between um, uh, four to six months um, to a maximum of eight months, um, along with consultations, etc. And once the designs are completed, they're tendered out to a contractor in, in Chennai. Um, uh, every year, about 25 kilometers of streets are implemented. So if, um, you know, with a maximum of one to one and a half years, you could actually look at transforming about um, 10 to 15 kilometers, because most of this work actually happens simultaneously. For a designer to design one street or to design 15 kilometers would invariably take the same amount of time. And hence, um, within a year and a half, you can actually look at um, redesigning and implementing about um, um, 10 to 15 to up, up to 25 kilometers of streets, depending on um, uh, the experience of the designer, the contractor, as well as the engineering team that you have uh, on board. Great. Thank you, Ashwadi. So I think we are going to finish just in time for all of um, our attendees today. But first and foremost, I want to thank you again for hosting a great webinar and sharing this wealth of materials with us today. And for our attendees, again, thank you for joining. And we look forward to sharing, sharing with you the recording, the PowerPoint, as well as the links to all of the guidebooks and workbooks that um, we went through during today's session. And then secondly, one other thing I'd like to point our attendees to is that we will have a webinar next week as well, and it is titled <clears throat> um, Greater Boston Bus Experiments from Pilots to Permanent Impacts. So this webinar next Wednesday will focus on how cities across the U.S. are also starting to recognize buses as a high impact solution to improve frequent transit and increase access to jobs and other destinations. Through this webinar, our host will walk us through lessons from the metro area, area in Boston and also give salient solutions and insights on how cities across the U.S. can work collaboratively with local transit agencies for greater investments in bus service. Um, so I will include the registration link to that webinar as well. And if, if you enjoyed today's session, um, I also encourage you to join us again next week. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you again to Ashwadi and we hope to see everyone online again soon. Thank you, Christina. Thank you everyone for joining this particular session. Thank you. Thank you, take care.